So thanks all of you for joining this discussion. Kind of surprised all the folks here, some new faces. So that's great. Um, just maybe a couple of things. Artith wants to share a little bit about, um, about Kent Nurburn, uh, the author, before we start to, and I'll probably throw in a few comments. And then I think we'll just dive, dive in. Um, but let's just begin with a word of prayer, shall we? Gracious Lord, thanks for drawing us together and drawing us together around this topic and just pray that uh, we'd have ears that hear and eyes that see and as you continue to direct our lives in ways of service and reconciliation. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, maybe I would just point out that, uh, you know, Ardeth and I did whip out a few questions. That was the easy part, but uh, we're really hardly experts. Actually, we're not experts at all. So it's kind of on you all to kind of carry this. And I would just invite you, you know, to kind of jump in wherever you're, you're comfortable. If you want to read a little passage, there's some things some truths here that are stated in their unique and eloquent ways. If you want to share some of those and comment on it, that's absolutely fine. We don't have to go chapter by chapter. We can just sort of dive into whatever topic I think surfaces uh, for you. But Artith, why don't you just go ahead and tell us a little bit uh, about Kent Nurburn. Okay, well, he was a very interesting person. He he was born near Minneapolis and grew up there. And then he went on to graduate from the University of Minnesota with a degree in American studies, I believe, and humanities maybe. And he got a master's at um, Stanford in religious studies. And then he went on and got a, to the uh, theological Union and with the University of California, Berkeley, got a PhD in uh, religious studies and art. And he actually started out as a sculptor uh, um, making um, larger than life sculptures from trees. And then after he went back to Minnesota and went to northern Minnesota, he worked with the um, Ojibwe. Uh, tribe up near Bemidji and wrote, um, helped write some oral stories uh, from the elders, helped, helped some youth. And he realized that he could reach more people writing than he could sculpting. So he went on to write like 16, or no, more like 20 books. And some of you may have read others. I know Martha has read this book is part of a trilogy and there's two more in it, The, the Wolf of Twilight, uh, Twilight and the Girl Who Sang a Buffalo. So uh, anyway, and he's also written some books that are more on just uh, spirituality, not necessarily about Native American uh, spirituality. He, um, he, his genre, he says, is creative, non-fiction and we might discuss that a little more later later in the book what he means by that um, and he says he's his work is a search for an authentic american spirituality and uh, integrating the judeo-christian traditions with other traditions around the world and uh, that of the indigenous people here in here in America. And a, a couple other themes, he's, he's very interested in the human condition and our responsibility to the earth and to its people and to their future. So those are, so and another thing about his philosophy, his favorite quote is from the Lakota chief sitting bull and it's his entreaty Come, let us put our minds together to use what kind of, to see what kind of life we can create for our children. So he's he hasn't retired. His wife retired from uh, Bemidji, the university or, or college there, and they moved, they moved to out 
side of Portland someplace. And he lives there and writes and he's closer to his grandchildren. And I guess he thinks the climate's a little nicer in the winter <laughs> So anyway, that's some of the context for um, Kent Nurburn. He's also, if you want to learn more about him, just go to Kent Bird. His name is hard. Kent Nurburn.com about. And there's lots of interesting um, information, and you can and see him give. He's very good at speaking as well. So, anyway, that's some background. Thanks. That's great. Um, these first four chapters, he introduces several themes that you're going to find woven throughout the book. They're not the only themes that are in the book, but um, certainly uh, Nurburn's discomfort. <laughs> Do you notice that uh, going on to the reservation for the first time? And he finds himself kind of out of sync quite often with um, his Native American um, colleagues there. Uh, certainly land is front and center, what it means terms of and uh, in terms of Indian identity and and then of course spirituality uh, if to me you know kind of thinking back on this if there's one one theme I guess for me I would say the thing that comes through the most is this notion of loss and uh, you know it's loss of land loss of identity loss of language loss of culture loss of roots um, and you really get that in so much of Dan's uh, comments. And I suspect that loss is primarily predicated on one awful fact. Um, and that fact is, um, before Columbus came, the best estimates we have of Native American population in this country are somewhere between two and seven million people call it four or five million. Uh, in the 1900 census, there were 237,000 Native Americans in this country. Now they probably weren't able to count everybody. These Native Americans weren't even citizens in 1900. They didn't get citizens till in the twenties, but uh, uh, so that's probably not a real accurate count, but Nonetheless, you would expect population to increase <laughs> in most cases, but clearly Native American population decreased. And that decrease was um, intentional for the most part, systematic. And, uh, uh, you know, we kind of bear the responsibility for that even yet today. It's an ugly part of our history. And, um, so that kind of theme, that sense of loss is just really a powerful part of uh, this whole book, I think. Uh, are you familiar with the words uh, settler and decolonization in the context of talking about Native Americans and reconciliation, justice? Okay, those are fairly common words. I see a couple of, it's interesting. Um, We've kind of been on a journey now that I think about it in the last two or three years in some of these classes. Think about this. I, I kind of feel like, what do they call it now? Becoming woke. Are you becoming woke? <laughs> uh, being woke was just uh, that was just added to the English dictionary uh, in 2017. And mm. it's not just the past tense of wake. Being woke is sort of being aroused. Awaken, if you will. Kind of an old concept, though. Remember uh, your. Do you remember your consciousness being raised? It's yes. kind of an old concept. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we've been woke, or getting. I'm getting woke. I think, and even in you know in classes we've had over the last two or three years, we've dealt with food insecurity. Somewhat about creation care. We've talked about mass incarceration. We've talked about racism. And now we're kind of looking at this. So we're, you're kind of getting a, a whole potpourri, a smorgasbord, if you will, <laughs> of issues you can dig into. And we hope, you know, that as these doors kind of open up and people become a little bit more aware, they find things that they can tie into. Okay. Um, uh, 
Let me just one more comment. Settlers and decolonization. I was just really kind of fascinated with the use of settler because in this contest, it means something maybe a little different. I mean, we all know about our forebears that came across the covered wagons and all, but settler in this context really deals with um, people who colonize as, as opposed to mere immigrants who come in and sort of fit in. I mean, when you colonize from this perspective, basically you take and you displace, <laughs> you kind of dominate, right? You kind of superimpose a way of life. And, you know, there's a lot to talk about with that. I, mean, I don't know how you feel about it, but when they say settler in some of these discussions, um, if, you, if you read farther about this, that's kind of, that's the concept they're talking about. Um, and then so decolonization, since settlers colonize, right? Decolonization is the process of taking away those kind of colonizing influences that keep people, and in this case, Native Americans sort of in their place, if you will. So uh, an activist in, in, uh, that wants to work in the area of Native American rights and so forth, this becomes a decolonizer. There you have it. All right, so let's just sort of start. What, uh, I don't know, or just open up to you. Is there anything that particularly struck you that you wanna just jump in here? Um, some let me passage? ask a question, Wayne, about sure. your, uh, your population numbers. Uh, was the first number uh, before contact with the Europeans? Yeah. Yes. So there, there was a massive die off because of European um, diseases, smallpox. Uh, right. And, and that was, I think, unintentional. I would agree. Okay. That's certainly true. Well, and it was very early on, 1600s, mm -hmm. when my ancestors got here in 1630, there were relatively few Indians in the Northeast because they had all died of previously of uh, white man's diseases. There, there were times that was helped along. I'm reading a book about Daniel Boone right now and some of the British uh, uh, officers actually invited the Indians in and handed out blankets that had been infected to send them home with as a weapon. <laughs> oh my goodness. Uh, <laughs> when we read about the Trail of Tears, uh, that was the uh, the government sending people away from being east of the uh, Mississippi River, and you were talking about the the Indians in the Northeast. That's what the, any remains of them. Uh, they didn't go in that same trail uh, to Oklahoma, but they were uh, sent off out, away from their home also. Relocation, I think, got a kind the of a policy start in about 1830, if I'm not mistaken. And that started a number of kinds of movements um, as, as um, settlers moved into the area, yeah, to include the Trail of T Tears, which were, I think, Southeast Indians, if I remember right. Yeah, usually you think of the Trail of Tears as the Indians going to Oklahoma. Uh, the ones in the Northeast didn't go there. Right. Right. Oklahoma was the wild west then, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. I guess I up with them. Go ahead, Barb. I was very struck by the his no the whole idea that you know people in America want to say they've got Indian blood. Oh and yeah. And how unique that is, but it has to be only the Cherokee. Well, they have <laughs> what do but you make has, of that? I mean, well, you think there, there's some truth? Well, they make them so Id idyllic. It kind of reminds me of putting women on a pedestal. Mm. You know, um, there's this idealized version that's not real because you don't want to really talk to and get to know these people. You just have an image of what they, they can give to you. And I think the uh, American Indians have had that for a long time. Yeah, Dan talks about that. I can't remember if that's in the first couple of four chapters or later on, but about the wise Indian. Kind of idea. Yeah. He sort of he doesn't buy it. <laughs> so are there any uh, Native Americans taking this class now? 
You mean tonight here? Any of us? So. I'm not. <laughs> any uh, any Native American wannabes? <laughs> Anybody <laughs> claiming some blood here? Peggy B. I, I have an adopted granddaughter yeah. who has some Native blood. Okay. But, uh, it, it doesn't show up on her uh, uh, genetic thing. So it may be uh, a phantom native blood. Why don't we jump into that a little bit? Remember, Dan talks about, uh, or no, I guess Nurburn asked Dan, doesn't he? Uh, so how do you feel about titles? You know, should, should I call you Native American? Should I call you Indian? And this starts, you remember, a whole a whole thing about Dan. What was his conclusion, you think, about Native American labels? Remember that? Yeah, they don't like it. He thought it was too bad that they had gotten the mistake in the beginning, but uh, you know, it was just the way that life was, that they were being called Indians, and what they'd always been called, and probably what they're gonna be called for a long while. I think, now, Go ahead. Go ahead, Peggy. I think now they call them actually uh, Native Americans. Mm -hmm. um, what Dan didn't like was to be called savages. No, he didn't want. Oh, he, he didn't that, like that was a title. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, he, why. Didn't, <laughs> he didn't like the, the stereotypes either that some sports teams, you know, with the Tomahawks and. Um, he didn't really care if you called them Native Americans or Indians, but he didn't like using them as symbols or icons for something else. I mean, even deeper, he, he didn't he think, he says all these are just sort of arbitrary labels put on us by other people. He says, actually, none of them are, are particularly meaningful at all. Mm -hmm. He says, we have our own stories about who we are and where we came from. And he says, even the anth our, our anthropologists don't buy into our own stories. They say, no, you came across the bridge. He says, no, our stories told us which creator placed us here. So his identity wasn't tied up in any of the kinds, kinds of uh, labels that are put on. And even if he said, he said the whole notion of tribe and blood quantum was uh, imposed by the federal government as a way to sort of distinguish. And he says, you know, if you're, we, we, we take somebody as, who may be even half white, and, but if they're native and they grow up with us, they're native, that's, just, that's all there is to it, you know? So it's more of a way of life maybe, rather than a label, I think, um, yeah. Well, you know, I am one eighth Samish, which is a tribe from uh, Anacortes area. I grew up in Clallam Bay, went to school in Clallam Bay, graduated from Clallam Bay. Mm -hmm. Never, ever was my Indian blood brought up when I lived in Clallam Bay. And then I came to Fort Angeles after graduation and I got a job up at Hurricane Ridge as a waitress. And uh, I, I was working the counter and I, I don't know what I was doing, but I heard somebody say, hey, Pocahontas, can you bring me some coffee? And uh, oh, wow. I, I said to myself, I didn't know we had anybody named Pocahontas working here, you know, because I didn't think he was talking to me. Really? Nobody ever oh, said that no. before. And so I didn't respond to him. And then the next thing he says, hey, Squaw, I asked you for a cup of coffee. Mm. And then I knew he was talking to me. Mm. And so... Never, ever grew up with any prejudice when I was out there. Did you so. see yourself as Native then? Growing up yeah, I knew I was Native, yeah, because I was a lot darker than everybody else, yeah. Okay. Wow. <laughs> That's quite a story. <laughs> what, what, was your, what was your response to him when he called you Squaw? Well, <laughs> I think I just brought him a cup of coffee and didn't say anything to him. You know, you have to remember, I think I was 18. Yeah. And, uh, he he would have gotten a cup of coffee thrown at him now. Oh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Did anybody yeah. Um, kind of come to your defense or talk to you later? No. About no. no. Yeah. No. Interesting. No. Oh. No. And squaw is a different meaning 
to the, and I'm just going to say this, the white man than it is to the Native American. It's two, there's two different meanings. What are they? The meaning for a squaw with a white man is, uh, um, well, a slut. Uh, the white man usually picked her up as a woman that just could keep him warm and provide um, uh, his needs, all of his needs. A squaw in Native American is like a princess. Mm -hmm. It's it's an honor to be a squaw in Native American. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was I was very um I was very uh, fascinated with the whole idea that. Um, the Native American Indian um, Dan uh, felt like the creator had placed them here, that they had not migrated. Mm -hmm. um, and, and also how he thought that um, uh, the white man would have loved to have seen him as an, another immigrant. Um, but in fact, they were they, they were here, and they um, and the Creator put them here, uh, and that's I had never heard that before. And it's like, wow, why not? You know, um, so, and I'm sure that that would conflict with Judeo Christianity, right? Who believed that the first person Adam and Eve were placed somewhere in the, in the Middle East. Um, so, and everything originates from there, right? I mean, I, I don't ascribe to that at all necessarily, but, um, but having been raised uh, that way, I would expect that that's what they would say, right? I don't know. Um, I, I think all homo sapiens have one common ancestor and whether that was someplace in the Middle East is ir irrelevant. The, the, the ancestor has been around for so long, uh, they've got uh, uh, people that have migrated all over the world. That well, you know, I, I was in America, Samoa for a while um, with Bud and they thought, the American Samoans thought that their island was the Garden of Eden. And that's where God had created them first in that Garden of Eden. It's huh. a nice place. <laughs> What's the term in Canada? First Nations? First Nations. Yes. Right. Sort of kind of picks up on that idea that they were here, I guess. I don't know. It would certainly fix one's identity if you believe that, wouldn't it, though? I mean, it would... And then any other attempt to change that identity would just seem kind of odd to you, I would imagine, which is kind of where Dan... Was. Forget what Dan's reference to, uh, I don't think he used First Nations, he said First People, but First people. Lots, lots of different tribes had the same... That same kind of concept, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did you uh, relate to Nurburn at all about entering the... The reservation, the kind of his discomfort. Could you, did that speak to anybody? Just curious. Well, you asked about Nia Bay. And for us to go to Nia Bay is not the same as for Nurburn to go to these people to write a book. So I don't feel any discomfort with going to Nia Bay to go fishing or something, but, but to insert him into their culture to record, I could see why that would be a whole different level of discomfort. It's a community where you're an outsider. So I think that's part of the source of, of discomfort. For him. Not that it was necessarily uh, that it was Native American, uh, but it just he was he was not part of their culture. And I think that Dan, he wasn't really welcoming all the time. You know, he'd have his periods of silence. And I don't know, he wasn't like, even though he did want him to write the book, it wasn't like, oh, I'm so glad you're here. It was like, 
it had to be on his time. And I think that would be very uncomfortable. Like there were multiple times where Kent was like, should I leave? Should I be here? You know, so that part of it would be hard even for any of us, I think, you know. And a lot of awkward moments for sure. Exactly. Yeah, it wasn't his first time on a reservation. He'd spent oh, a lot of time. Oh. And it wasn't that he hadn't been involved with Native Americans. He'd been involved with them quite a bit, apparently, up to this point. I'm curious, Peggy. Yes. From having lived out at Nia Bay, what was the no, view? No, Clallam Bay. Life, or Clallam Bay. Clallam Bay. Oh, yeah. All right. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Take it back. But, yeah, yeah I remember, though, uh, <laughs> Nia Bay had a very lousy football feel. That's what I remember. <laughs> <laughs> it was also the cow pasture. So, uh, but I think I think the Lakota tribe in um, Montana and the tribes in Montana are very very poor. And so when you go on the reservation, it, it's bad. It's really bad. You go out to Nia Bay, you know, it's it's okay. There's houses, there's development, there's fishermen, there's um, stores. But you go to Montana where the Lakota Indians are, it is very poor, very poor. Um, and you, it's it's a different reservation than going to Nia Bay or going to the Puyallup tribe, you know, entirely different. Mm -hmm. yeah, they need Excuse me, John, go ahead, I'm sorry. I was gonna say, uh, he talks about junk cars. And if you start to look for junk cars, uh, the the plains are where you find the junk cars defining the reservation. Out here, they're occasional. But the, the right. tribes, I think, are trying to keep up appearances. Uh, right. They've given up on that back. <laughs> Was it in the first four chapters where he's kind of going through his angst about being there and seeing all this stuff and everything? No. And then he goes to Grover's house? No. Yeah. He goes to Grover's house, I think, in the first and, four chapters, does he? No. But, he did, but there was a lot of, farther on, it was. Oh, is that further on? Okay, then I won't. Book, yeah. If you haven't read it, I won't. Yeah. Okay. It so, was just kind of funny. <laughs> Mm -hmm. It was. There was a lot of humor in the book. What did what did you or did you find some humor in this first four chapters? I liked when he said, "You we, you better hope your God is right." <laughs> <laughs> what did he mean by that, Barb? Mm -hmm. um, well, they they. What did he say? He said, uh, "We believe in the Mother Earth, and we've taken such good care of her, and she still sends us horrible winters and strife." Whereas you don't really take care of the land mm -hmm. and you have a God who lives above and the land is just kind of a stage for you. So yeah. you believe that your God is the right God and not my God. <laughs> You're supposed to, to uh, make the land bear fruit. Well, well, we didn't have much population. The, the belief was basically gave, God gave us the land to exploit. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's one interpretation. Yeah. Uh, but why does, <laughs> yeah. In contrast. <laughs> yeah, to what? But didn't, uh, didn't the white man think that way about just about every place they went? This is ours, we're taken over. Okay, so that gets you to what Dan's distinction between property and land. Why don't you go there? Property versus land. Somebody want to review those distinctions? Right. What's property? Property is what you you own it. Yeah. Right. You it's either you own it or it's willed to you, but it's yours. You have a deed for it. And what was what was Dan's view of of so, land then? In contrast, yeah, to you know God God gave us the land, um, and it had nothing to do with ownership. So they never felt like. When the white man came to ask for it, they it was like, "Well, wait a minute, we don't own. You know, it's yeah. not ours. It's ours to share. We'd like to share it, but um, yeah, the white man had no interest in that. They wanted to own it and then do with it what they wanted." 
Well, and it seemed to me that it was relational. The the land, the creatures were all part of their family. Uh, the orcas, the buffalo, whatever they they are their their mothers and fathers and sisters and brothers. Mm -hmm. And to be treated as such, I was really struck by the anecdote. He said, "Well, you know, you don't own your grandmother." <laughs> but she's she's a part of you <laughs> and same with the land and the animals you don't own them but they're a part of you it's more familial wasn't it yeah yeah well, and the notion that they were to be respected as, as opposed to exploited or, or used and destroyed wantonly you know driving you know riding by in the train shooting the buffalo for nothing other than sport so right so kind of take that a little farther so Indians use the land you know they burned the prairie to kind of clear things out they certainly took food from the land we used to live in central Idaho before we came here up in what's called Long Valley and it was a gathering place of three major tribes of sort of neutral ground I guess people would come up to high country in the summer and they'd graze and they'd hunt and they'd gather they'd fish they'd have games and they go back to more of their traditional areas. So certainly Indians used land, uh, used resources. What's what's the big difference? Is I it think the, or what? I, I think the Europe, European always felt individualistic, that everything was, you know, for me. Hmm. Whereas the, the in, uh, Native Americans we're more interested in sharing and sharing alike, being in community with each other. Yeah, sharing within their own tribal community, definitely. That you didn't own something that your uh, other tribal members couldn't have. It's a pretty fundamental difference in values there. Well, it sounds like. sacred. Yeah, and then you throw in sacred on top of that. And yeah, they they took you know, took what they needed mm -hmm. and, and gave thanks for what they, you know, what they received. Um, and I, I keep thinking back to the book, uh, Cadillac Desert, that's written, uh, well, some time ago now, but about uh, water rights in the West and the kind of expansion into the West. And the author there talks about conservation that, you know, we have uh, Americans look at conservation, uh, like if you have a certain amount of water rights, conservation is not conserving it, conservation is using it, you know, you have to use all the rights that you have, because if you don't, somebody else is going to come and take it. And um, I, I contrast that with some of the, you know, that what we're, you know, we, we here with the uh, kind of the Indian culture. Um, Maybe when the Europeans came over here, where they where they left Europe, they were like all together, you know, like the buildings were all really close and they lived really close and you didn't have any space. So maybe when they came over here, they go, wow, look at all this space. I got to have it. And maybe maybe that was their attitude. I, I need this space. I think I they, they, they were already in a system of ownership. Yeah. Uh, you know, they may not have owned things if they were poor, but they were from a community that that had ownership as the main mold, main mode of how property was uh, distributed. But even if you if you fly to Europe now um, and you look, you see fairly well defined cities, and you know overhead you see you know much smaller farms that are you know delineated and so that they have done more you know over time to kind of preserve that sort of way of life as opposed to you know looking in the in the west and you know these huge farms corporate farms and and sprawling cities you know that just just keep growing and growing and growing so i i, I think that maybe says a little bit something about our our attitude of, of land and property and you know what we do with it I think it flows out of the uh, the Jewish background that we have that uh, they felt they owned the land. The, the land had been given to them. Uh, and there was definitely uh, property ownership uh, pre-Christianity. 
It seems to me as if part of the issue of ownership has to do with competition, that we are extremely competitive people. And the more we own, whether it's land, money, or playthings, um, there's a sense of competition involved in it. Um, and I'm not sure if I see that at all in, in Indian culture, uh, that competition. Okay, we're kind of scratching around. I wouldn't mind hearing some more about this. You know, I look at all you, I don't see a bunch of, uh, of selfish, mongering, grabbing human beings here. And yet, <laughs> that is the perception coming from the other side of us. Where did that come from? I mean, what? why this huge disparity? Where, where did we want, where did we get to want some things? John says, it comes from our Judeo-Christian heritage and the notion that land is given by God somehow, you know. Uh, competition maybe fits into that. How, how, why are we so different, you know? <laughs> we're, looking, we're looking for security. And with things, we have security. Okay. Kind of gives See, us... See, I, I have a different viewpoint there. With things, you have responsibility. With, with things, you have the pressure of that responsibility. And uh, I don't know if I necessarily want that. Hmm. But I think the interesting thing is, I think a lot of it is just, if you go back to people trying to describe, you know, what is the American character? And, you know, the country was originally filled with people who were willing to take a chance and come here and most of them were seeking economic gain. I mean, that's, that's why they came here. Um, so you've got a, you know, a, a selection of the population. You're not just getting average folks to show up here. I mean, there is a pre-selected group that's very ambitious that comes over here. And if you kind of watch what they did crossing the country, it's just so different than what the Indians did that it's just, I mean, they're basically harvesting the country as they head west. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm reading this book about Daniel Boone, which is, you know, he's, he's pre-Revolutionary War and he's in Kentucky and they're slaughtering the buffalo back then in Kentucky. So, you know, you know, by the time they get out to the Midwest on in the plains and they're slaughtering the buffalo, it's not a surprise. They, they've already done it. They, they did it 70 or 80 years later further east. Um, and you read these stories and Daniel Boone was making his living by slaughtering 50 deer a day. Um, and I just think that's so antithetical to the way the Indians were about living. Uh, and they were mortified when they would find these campsites with these people collecting it and the number of carcasses that would just be piled there because they were just skinning the animals to sell the skin. Uh, you know, the, the, they weren't eating the meat, or put, put in a big pile. And I just think that kind of avarice just didn't fit in with their view of being part of the earth. I mean, in terms of, you know, that's their home and they're showing respect for all of those things as opposed to just, these are resources we can use and turn into cash. We were presented, Europeans were with a giant Costco, weren't we? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and they didn't even need a membership card. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> But, I, but I'm still, I'm still kind of um, befuddled by what made us think we could just run over the people that were here. I wonder where that where that comes from. You know, I mean, well, we just kind of built some momentum and could never stop. Or I mean, it wasn't like there were never voices saying, "Hey, wait, what's going on?" There were, you know, they weren't mm -hmm. pervasive, obviously. Do Do you think it was because? Um, Again, we felt that our God was the true one true God, and he had given us in some ways a superiority over what, you know, whatever we encountered. And it was part of our job as far as God was concerned to, um, to be missionaries and to uh, evangelize and um, bring people to um, to our God. So I, we didn't see 
unfortunately, um, the Indian as uh, equal to us. Okay. Other thoughts? Yeah. Yeah. I think the, the first colonies were often settled by people who were trying to escape from oppression, from uh, religious oppression, from uh, hunger. Uh, but they, they were taking a risk uh, not to get wealthy, uh, but because they, they wanted to get something that was uh, bearable. If that was the case, and I, I agree with that, that assessment of it, but it is interesting to me still that those original settlers had the audacity to think that the land belonged to them, that they could, that they, there was still a sense of superiority um, so that the land they could claim the land as theirs. There's a statement on page 49, and I think is I think is paramount to a lot of the stuff. He says the worst thing well, Dan is speaking, the worst thing is that you never even listen to us. Yeah. And he said it a number of times. Mm -hmm. You never even listen to us. If we have a sense of superiority, we don't need to sense, listen to anyone else. And that same process is happening today, um, I think, across the board with our ethnic issues and our, our, our racial issues, that we cannot possibly listen to each other, even as whites, let alone listen to anyone else either. Um, it happened then and it happens now. And taking it's, land from the Indians was uh, a political stance uh, called Manifest Destiny. And it happened very early on in our uh, uh, political life. It was a political life, but it was also, I think, a religious uh, sense that God had given them the land. Uh, I don't know under what basis, but <laughs> that's, I think that's what they felt. Well, doesn't, doesn't Genesis say uh, that uh, we're to dominate the land or no, uh, I don't think cultivate it? Uh, no, I don't think it says dominate the land. <laughs> well, I'm trying to think of the word, though, that, you know, I interpret the word to mean care for the land, so I'm not sure what the word is. <laughs> so I, well, given dominion over, but that doesn't mean dominion over. That, that's it, dominion. Yeah. That, in other Dominion's words, different than dominate, I would. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. yeah. But yeah. they seem to think, these white people coming in seem to think that these groups of people on the plains or wherever they were, were must be uneducated. They didn't have the same organization at all that the white man had. They assumed they were stupid. But to yeah, know, at the top of 49, he says, we just belonged to the land. They wanted to own it. That comes up several times in the, yeah. in the narrative. Mm -hmm. the, the Native Americans belonged to the land, not the other way around. And he also, Dan also brings out that the white people didn't um, appreciate the oral history, right, right. the origin stories that the natives, Native Americans had. They, they just discounted those because they weren't written down. And because they weren't the same as our stories. Yeah, their origin stories were different. So ours are the right ones. <laughs> Well, I think if, if you look back at the Declaration of Independence and Thomas Jefferson is writing that document, one of the bill of particulars against the British was that they were using the savages against them. <laughs> and, and that's, they were referred to as the savages in our Declaration of Independence, so. Yeah. <laughs>
And when you have that kind of a, a mindset, then you see your role as to tame and to civilize and um, yeah. yeah. Silence is the lie of a good man. Talk to me about that. This is Dan's quote. Mm -hmm, yeah. Silence is the lie of a good man. Or, I mean, yeah, is the lie of a good man. Isn't that just when you disagree, but you don't want to be rude? Could be. Yeah, I think it was the context of being nice rather than being honest. <laughs> oh, okay. Not speaking up and saying what you really think. I, I like the fact that uh, tobacco is, can be both just something that you smoke and then tobacco could be sacred. Mm -hmm. But that when you bring tobacco and you offer tobacco to someone, that's, that's telling him that you're going to be honest and that's asking in return that he be honest if, if or he or she. Um, I thought that was a really uh, very interesting and um, uh, notion um, and that when someone expect, accepted the tobacco, then yes, there would be honesty. And so Dan asked him, please uh, don't lie to me either in silence or uh, in your, with your words. Do, do we have anything like that? That is that clear that it alerts like if I'm talking to you, that I'm telling you the truth, that I've made a commitment. Is there anything like that in our culture that works that way? I mean, Dan goes on later chapters talking about words. You'll come upon that and our misuse of words and how words don't really mean a whole lot. Um, Dan, Dan well, points well, out, I'm sorry, Dan points out that uh, uh, some of these treaties were made with white men putting their hand on the Bible. That's what I was going to say too. Yep. If you put your hand on the Bible, you're supposed to be telling the truth. But no. Apparently that doesn't work either. So do we have nothing? <laughs> no. Handshakes don't work. Uh, Reputation. Reputation. Right. Yeah. You know, there's good guys and then there's bad guys. Well, doesn't Dan Not everybody wears... I'm sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, not everybody wears a white hat or a black hat. You don't know who is a good guy and who is the bad guy anymore. I like that Dan acknowledged, though, that, uh, you know, there are bad and good people in both of the, of the camps, mm -hmm. but most yeah. people are in the middle. Um, yeah. Right at the well, rest what was, the well, go ahead. Go what ahead. was that? What was that expression during the World War II when the Germans were coming and taking everybody and the guy said, I didn't say anything. And then they came and took someone else and I didn't say anything. Yes, yes. First and then they came to get me and there was nobody to say anything. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. Is the issue of silence and the silence of maybe the majority of people in the United States still part of part of our problem is that we are so silent even though we have strong feelings about things politically even religiously uh, but we tend to be still silent because we don't want to offend anyone or mm -hmm. we don't want to risk i'm not sure what all the issues are but it, i don't think it's a whole lot different in our society today no. Yeah, I don't think it is either. I don't think we want to rock the boat. We, right. we feel that uh, if we don't say anything, oh, it'll, it'll be all right. We hope it's going to go away. Somebody else yeah. will take care of it. Yes. On the other hand, there's been an awful lot of talk and not much traction either. So you kind of wonder about the value of words. Yeah. Uh, we kind of get stuck, don't we? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but our, our alternative is to uh, try to use force. Uh, it's not just to be quiet, but it's to uh, the big stick. go to war or yeah. shoot somebody, uh, which are 
Well, that's one alternative, but not the only one. I mean, yeah, why, is that, the, why, why is, is that the opposite of silence? Well, we all we have an argument about truth. What is the truth? Well, it's an interesting concept for Dan to bring up because he says that he's finally deciding to speak the truth, you know, as he's getting ready to die because nobody else may say these things. So, which is kind of interesting as it's, it's, you know, this isn't a uniquely, uh, you know, white man issue. I mean, it's an issue for the Indians too. I mean, you know, they aren't, they aren't telling the truth either. They're all, uh, I mean, he, I think he thinks they're being quiet as well, which is, uh, you know, are, are they lying to each other? based on the fact that nobody wants to verbalize what they feel. So. Well, he says nobody will listen to him anyway. <laughs> Be quiet. quiet. Some of you haven't had a chance to speak. I'd like Pat or Martha. Is it Ken over here? I'm not sure. Um, so don't be bashful. <laughs> Make your comments if you wish. Well, that just shut him up. Okay. So I, I am reading, reading the preface. I'm not sure what this one was called. Yeah. Um, it was just, I, I, it got me wrapped up back into the whole sequence again in his books. And I've read some of his other books. So the preface is quite moving, moving to me. And I'm, I thought, well, since I said I read the other books, maybe I'd start in on book two, because I, I don't remember things I read very well. Um, are you, so are the preface about the in one, the second book also is just I, is moving. Martha, are you are you talking about the, the 25th anniversary? The forward. I think she's talking, forward. Are you talking about the forward. Because there's. Uh, yeah, the that's book. what I wasn't sure. This book has a different forward than the 25th anniversary one. So is this the one you're looking at? Well, whatever. The first thing before the preface. And then whatever the next book is, Wolf at Twilight. So the Wolf at Twilight or the next book yeah. is, it just has a, I just read, started it tonight. And the preface in that is just moving also. In what way? The, the fact that it was uh, used as a as a point of dialogue between people and so forth. Yes, just just his his getting you a little bit into the story of how this all how writing the the stories of the kids and his experience with Native Americans and and yes the import the the importance of the book and how it became very popular and where it led after it was published. And just his, his uh, uh, belief, the sacredness of his promise to tell this story and what it means to him and how much trying to communicate the message um, of Native American people is important to him kind of a point of authenticity on his part. He seemed real, didn't he? Yeah. It wasn't phony. It was like he was believable. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Yeah. Are you talking about Kent? Just the, uh, that, that it's an honor for him to do this. And why you asked the question about him feeling uncomfortable entering the reservation. So I think it comes from that knowing their story is about being dominated and wiped out by the white people. So he's that white culture entering on to their land, approaching Dan um, is he knows the, the story behind it. He feels, whatever, not responsible, but he wanted the awkwardness of being the awkwardness of being white to a Native American and what you represent. Because they're mostly pissed off at you and hate you. 
Why do you think in both the newer edition and the older one, he does talk about the book having sort of a life of its own and it had been a, it, it turned out that it seemed to facilitate um, discussion between whites and, and, uh, and Native Americans. What, from what you've read so far, why, why do you think that occurred? Do you think, why, why did the book take on that kind of uh, purpose and character? What is it about the book? Any thoughts there? I'm just curious. I, I wonder because if- There's so much feeling and emotion within the book <laughs> and honesty. Okay. I, I wonder if it brings us to a common uh, or a shared sense of, of pain or loss. We, you know, we talked about that, um, you know, part of it is reading the, uh, this makes me look at what I learned in school, you know, about the history of westward expansion and everything. It, it uh, you know, it sort of kind of whitewashes, sort of maybe pun intended, I guess, but kind of whitewashes some of that history. And, and, and this brings more dimension to it. So there's a sense of loss that you, you can see what, devastation has been wrought uh, on indigenous people, but then also the sense of loss of, of, of who say we are as a, you know, white kind of a dominant culture in that having done all this and, and not reconciled any of it, mm -hmm. you know, that that's still just kind of out there and it resurfaces again and again and again, you know, with uh, whether it's pipelines running through land or something, we, we, we just, um, just keep repeating it. Yeah, I, th I think we still have very little respect for the, the treaties that we have made in the past. Uh, if you make a treaty today, uh, it's only if it's convenient that you can honor it. You can look at the salmon wars of the 70s and Washington for <laughs> that lesson. Yeah. You're okay. right, bury my heart, it wounded me as uh, 50 years old this year. Oh, that amazing. Yeah. yeah. It was for one of the first PW women's books I read in my 20s. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Boy. Well, the problem still persists, but you know, there's a lot of um, positive uh, activism in Indian country these days. So wokeness is happening, I think, not only to some extent in the white community, but also uh, in, in Native American communities as well. I think I've mentioned before, our son-in-law is Native and um, uh, his dad um, was governor of Acma Pueblo uh, for a few years. And it's just interesting talking to him about the kinds of issues they're dealing with and the kinds of solutions that are coming up and the kind of working together that they've done with other Pueblo groups in the Southwest. And, and uh, he's actually quite hopeful and he does see his people as being very resilient. And uh, just as a tag on to what I said, the, the population decline among Native Americans to 1900, but from 1900 to the 2020 um, uh, census, uh, we're now at about 5.7 of uh, Native Americans in this country too. And I'm sure that 5.7 million, yeah. Really? Yeah. So, uh, uh, you know, I think a lot of groups are, are kind of claiming resources and manage them and doing some interesting things. So a really interesting piece called Gather. Um, we brought a couple of things yeah. before we leave. Rosalie has seen this, yes, Gather. Yeah, I saw that, that. Yeah. You saw that? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. It's kind of a food uh, resilience, uh, self-sufficiency thing among an Apache group down in Arizona. And I would just point out too that uh, we're not slated to meet next week because I think it's sort of a travel day for a lot of people. And there was some maybe Thanksgiving services going on in the community next Wednesday. But um, I'd like to send you all a couple of links to one to a podcast and one to a TED talk. 
uh, the podcast deals with, and this just kind of stunned me. I didn't, I mean, this, where have I been? Uh, the podcast deals is called, um, where to go? Uprooted. Uh, it's done in 2019. And it follows the Indian Termination and Relocation Act of the 50s that was in effect until like 1972. This is our lifetime, people. We still had a quote, Indian problem uh, in our lifetime with a very specific policy to try to get rid of it. I mean, it's just, it's, it's a little bit disconcerting to say the, the very least. The TED Talk is um, uh, a native um, decolonization educator, I guess. And it's just a short talk, but she's very um, articulate and it'll kind of fill you in on some of the kind of intellectual thinking around uh, native rights and reconciliation and the whole business of decolonization too. So I'll just put those out in an email to you all. And you have an email for everybody? I would welcome, um, I mean, I well, hope, hope well, they take Wayne, a Wayne, I would Bye. encourage anybody that didn't look at your link to the PBS uh, uh, show on uh, the, the Pueblos, uh, watch that twice. Oh, you're going to get distracted by the beautiful scenery on the first yeah. one. <laughs> oh, you saw you yeah. saw the uh, our son-in-law's father in that. Then yeah. that was Kurt Riley. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead, Pat or Matt. Uh, yeah, I was wondering if you uh, have haven't gotten the email or like, can I forward you that email from Wayne? <clears throat> if you could put your email in the chat, and then Lauren, if you can save the save the chat. And that way we can get that entered. And, and Wayne, if you want, you can, um, well, if you want to email what you were talking about, the links would be great. And there's another person I don't know, I'm afraid, and that's Jean in my upper right-hand corner. Jean, do we have your email? Uh, Lauren, Lauren does, but I okay. can. Okay, all right. Uh, if you wouldn't mind sharing that with me, I'd make sure you get those links as well. Thank you, I'd appreciate yeah. that. So I'll, I'll put it in the chat. Okay, real good. I'd Thanks. like to share that there's, mm -hmm. I've watched two other besides The Gathering mm -hmm. um, productions on Netflix that have been made by <clears throat> the Oklahoma Indians. Oh and yes, they're based they are too. On, they yeah, are too. And then I watched one last night yeah. and of course, I grew up when cowboys and Indian movies were Saturday matinees. You know how they went. <clears throat> but these are all based, and at the end, they give you the real persons, how long they lived and everything. And, and the one last night was, uh, I can't remember the name of it. But if you just go looking through some of the documentaries, um, they're, they're having a lot of good documentaries on Netflix. That's the only television I get. It's Netflix. So, <laughs> um, yeah, there's a lot of good information out there. So I encourage you yeah. if you find some piece of this that you know, follow up, do your Google searches, share your resources. It'd be kind of fun to see what all we come up with. It'd be great and just sort of enrich the discussion. So, um, well, why don't we just close off in prayer again and thank the Lord for this time and. Uh, you all have a great Thanksgiving, okay? First is Lord, thanks again for drawing us together, for, uh, I don't know how you do it, but demonstrating your love through all the myriad of our foibles and, and goof-ups. We just thank you for uh, your um, consistent love in our direction that redeems and saves us. So give us all a good time uh, in the coming week and uh, safe travels as people leave and uh, look forward to being brought back together in your spirit in a couple of weeks. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you all. Good to see you. Thank ya. you. Take care. Yeah.